Obviously, the headline issue is pay. Since 2010, since the Tories came into power, there's been pretty much a 20% pay cut in real terms. What we're asking for is fairly modest. It's just we don't want to lose money. We just want to keep pace with inflation. The current offer, it's 5% across the board. At the lower ends, it's 89 but even then, it's still below inflation. We need to see our fight as the same as the teachers' fight because in both groups of workers, you're talking about 20% real terms pay cut. And that's why our ballots happening very close to each other is really important. 5% would barely cover the increase in fuel costs alone. There's very little you can actually do once you reach to the top of your pay scale. But in order to be able to get to that in the first place, you need to be able to afford to to pay your rent when you're starting out, you need to be able to afford to pay your bills. We are going for a discussion around having a starting salary of £30,000. We're fighting for a fully funded pay rise, a fully funded pay rise. What we want is that we want to make sure that the government puts the funding into the colleges in order to support our pay claim. The government is expecting the colleges to fund this, so it's like not our problem. Which is why we're not turning around to the colleges and saying, you need to find funds for this pay rise. We're turning to the government and saying, hey, come on, you can turn the taps on for the richest in society. How come you can't do it for working class people like us? are not actually lobbying the government for more money. We have been cut to the bone in um, the sixth form sector. Um, our support services are decimated. We're actually finding, as a situation now, we're finding it difficult to function. And now we're getting from the SFCA that we can't afford to give you any more money because otherwise we'll have to make more cuts to your services. The funding problem started with the economic crisis caused by the bankers, which I feel we've spent the last 10 years paying off. And it now seems to be adding insult to injury to then say to people, we've also got to pay for a new crisis. The workload for teachers has increased dramatically. It means that teachers are having to do lots of jobs that they didn't have to do 10 years ago. They have to have all the paperwork in order, lots of tick boxes. Um, lots of administration. There's lots of analysis regarding exam results and so on and that kind of fuels into the whole league tables and so on and you know the kind of funding that you would get as a college. There's never a year out because you don't, um, you've, you've always taken a new cycle of students who are getting ready for exams. The pressure of having to deliver results, everything is kind of very very much results based. They're also gradually increasing the number of teaching hours that we have to work number of groups that we need to see, that obviously increases our amount of planning time, our amount of assessment time. You're trying to sort out issues of support and mental health support and learning support with students alongside accessing resources for them. People will be working over the weekends, they'll be working at nights, um, you know, but you don't get paid overtime for that. We have this agreement for one, two, six, five hours directed time. All the marking, the preparation, the extra admin tasks don't fit into our one, two, six, five hours at all. We want to open up serious discussions regarding workload and working time. There's a massive crisis at the moment of recruitment and retention and teaching. It's been really hard for people to get a hold of good teachers. If you can't get the staff, you've got to go to agencies. That is more that is more expensive than paying staff proper wages. With the way that the pay has slipped and private sector pay has gone up, there's a lot of talk now where there didn't used to be of people leaving the profession. Newer staff found it extremely difficult to actually live in London. And we've had staff who have relocated to elsewhere in the UK as a result of that. London is so much more expensive than everywhere else. We want to increase in the London allowance because that has not been matching the increase in transport costs and the increase in housing costs. Our paying conditions are also children's learning conditions as well. It's the uh, students in more deprived areas that end up suffering. Back in 2012, we had the first round of redundancies and then probably within about six years, we'd lost about 92 staff. But with that staff, you, you, were, you were losing expertise. You know, we were no longer running um, uh, German or f philosophy or religious studies or music or music technology. It feels like if you're in a working class college that 
These things are seen as luxuries. Creative arts is one of our biggest growth areas of economic opportunities for young people. And yet the education agenda seems to be squeezing those subjects out. They literally don't count for schools point scores, so the schools don't invest in them and then you get less students coming through. A lot of our students have to go without, say, like textbooks. There's a severe lack of technology within the college and opportunities for trips. We do have massive, massive mental health crisis amongst our young people. Every year there are more young people in my groups that need help. I would say today in my classroom I felt like three of my students needed intensive uh, support and that's just in one class. And that goes hand in hand with like the cutting of the actual services that can help them. So many of my students work full time, so many of them are carers for parents, a lot of them have lost families through the pandemic, especially students from BME backgrounds. I have one British Asian student who said he'd been to 10 funerals after the pandemic. So many more students with anxiety, mental health issues, and we weren't given, well, instead of giving us more funding to help us deal with that, it was reduced dramatically. During the pandemic, everyone stepped up, especially in sixth form, because in the sixth form sector, you've only got two years of teaching. We were having to do a lot more work to give our young people the education they deserved. None of that's been recognised, as it hasn't been throughout the public sector. I had a complaint from one member who said they had to take a sick day because they woke up and they couldn't stop crying <laughs> because of the stress <laughs> that they were under. Uh, similarly, you know, people who they get to work and they just cry in their car <laughs> before they start work. If a student tells you that, you do what is the reasonable thing and you say, what can we do to help you? you know, what can we do to support you? But, you know, where's the support from us? If we're not valuing teachers, we are ultimately, I think, leading to a collapse of the education system as such, and it ultimately impacts young people. Just before the pandemic, the strongest colleges took action over the fact that we wanted to equalise with the teachers' pay. The usual, well, there's no money, we can't afford it, and yet virtually every sixth form got a pay rise. We've had some success stories at the local level. Our last strike action had about 12 items on workload. We've managed to get a victory on that. So it just shows that taking strike action can win you demands. We know that the money's there. We've seen the money squandered on personal protective equipment scandals. We've seen it go on tax breaks for the rich. We're not striking against the students or the college. We're striking for the students. We're striking for the college. We're striking against the government. We want those students to be able to advocate for themselves. And we, we can't do that if we can't advocate for ourselves. You can take up to about 18 days strike action and your wages won't be affected to the same kind of extent than um, if you don't get a pay rise. It's really important that as workers we use this opportunity of this kind of shared fury and sense of injustice and realisation that it's time that we united and fought back. The RMT started it off with the rail workers, you've got our postal workers, you've got the nurses who are about to start a ballot. I think we all feel the same in terms of we deserve Pay rise. It feels that we have a real movement for change. I'm an ex-South African and lived during the period of apartheid. It was always mentioned to us that you're never going to actually change anything. And the coming together of different sectors of society in a mass mobilization made the country ungovernable so that they could not do anything else but actually listen to us. A week later there's a postal strike, so we need those votes in immediately. The very first thing is check that your details are updated, because if it does not go to your home address, it cannot be legally taken into consideration. You can email the union, you can talk to your rep. Let your rep know that you've voted, and let your rep know immediately if you've not received a ballot. I'd say to reps, get staff room volunteers from different departments. It's very difficult to get around a big college, but you can ask other people to help with that. Being organised and having a list of names and ticking those names off and talking to people, making sure that vote gets in, that is what is going to win us the vote this time. Please vote yes in the ballot. Let's fight, let's stay strong, let's sort this out once and for all.